So some of you have noticed that there are a few uh, sour drops around the room, um, here and there and everywhere. And so that all this, all that's gonna make, all of it's gonna make sense in a few minutes. But this is all derived from our ladies had lemonade and chat time a few Mondays. Actually, this past Monday, we got together and all we did was we talked about life over some good lemonade. Okay, so when we get together and we hear other people's stories, it empowers us, it encourages us. And the Bible says that two are better than one. So that night, two were better than one. And I got to hear people's stories and how they turned sour lemons into lemonade that night. And some of us may need a few resources here and there to, to do life because life happens to everyone. Amen. It doesn't just happen to the person down the street. It doesn't just happen to your neighbor. It happens to me. It happens to your pastor. It happens to the neighbor beside you. So life happens to everyone. So that is what today is derived from. When life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Amen. And it's a choice to make some lemonade. You don't have to make lemonades. You don't have to go to the kitchen and deep squeeze some lemons. But it's a choice to go to the kitchen, cut up those lemons, take the seeds out, and make some lemonade. We, we always point you to Jesus and the word. This is what we live by. And if you have a situation in your life, this is what we live by. So in the Bible, we, we see many stories where our jaws drop and things come, things happen in the Bible and we're sitting as now in retrospect because in the, in the Bible, these people that are in the Bible didn't see the whole story. They didn't have the Bible to see the whole story finished. But we have the, uh, um, the benefits of seeing how people's lives ended, right? So in the Bible, we see where there are many uh, situations that happen to people, just good old down-to-earth people just like you and I. You know, we have um, David, David who, who from the very beginning when a prophet Samuel goes to look for him, he's overlooked. His own father, Jesse, does not even consider him as a king. In fact, he's in the back somewhere herding some sheep because he's not even considered to be a king. So he's overlooked. Have you ever been overlooked for, uh, for a promotion at a job? Maybe you've, maybe you've been talked about and you're just not even considered to be the person to do the job or you've been slandered. All sorts of things that, that we can encounter, and David encounters some of those things. And, and then we hear about Ruth. I mean, how many of you guys know Ruth in the Bible? Her husband dies. How many people are dying in 2019? People are dying every day. Life happens. People get bad diagnosis. We get bad reports in the midnight hour. We get a phone call while we're dead in our sleep that something has happened to our children. Life happens to people. Can I tell you that life happens to people we are not exempt. The Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust. That means those that are doing good and those that are not doing good. Amen. So we can find all these stories in the Bible and we can read about it and we can have hope, right? We can, we can get some good old hope when we see that sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, God shows up for his people. Um, the person that I'm going to talk to you today is, is about a good old man named Joseph. How many of you guys have heard about Joseph in the Bible? He's referred to as the man with the coat of many colors. So, so this guy, Joseph, so we have this man who encounters life, who encounters life, and he, he faces some gloom and doom, and he has some curveballs thro thrown to him, and he's shocked by life. He's blindsided. I know none of you in this room have never had any curveballs thrown at you. You've never been blindsided about an, event, about an event in your life. I don't know about you, but I am not a person to immediately default to a negative thinking. If something negative happens to me, I'm like, okay, God, how are you going to work this out? And maybe you, you intended this to happen. Like my mindset is of wealth. I'm not talking about tithe and offering. My mindset is immediately but I serve a God who's big and I have hope in God. This hope is in God. Now there are those people that immediately speculate, she's, she's up to something. How is she trying to, you know, you know, take something from me? And that is not how I function. And I choose to have the joy of the Lord. Amen. I choose to believe in the God that I serve and the hope that he gives us. And so we have this man named Joseph who who encounters a thing, amen. He encounters a few things. And in the book of Genesis 45.4, it says, and I'll give you some history in a few minutes after I read this passage. It says, this is Joseph talking. Come closer to me, Joseph said to his brothers. They came closer. 
I am Joseph, your brother, whom you, sold, whom you sold into Egypt. But don't feel badly. Don't blame yourselves for selling me. God was behind it. So the last part of that passage says, God was behind it. I want you, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, God was behind it. God was behind it. So God was behind the situations that Joseph encountered in life. And pastor has been, has been doing this series on dependency on God, deep waters. And if you know about Joseph, we had to depend on God, amen. He has to depend on God because some things don't turn out as planned or curveballs come and we are blindsided and we're completely our jaw drops before God in life, amen. So, so we have this, this, this man named Joseph who is initial reaction. We don't know what his initial reaction is at the moment, but we see where he is sold by his brothers. I'm going to give you some history now. So he's sold by his brothers. Um, first, they, they concoct this plan to throw him in this pit where there's no water. So he's, he's bound to die. At some point, they decide, let's just sell him. And they sell him to a group of Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. 20 pieces of silver. They sell him for some money. And the reason that they concocted this plan towards Joseph is because his brothers were envious of him. They didn't like him. In fact, I think he was considered a tattleteller. Jacob is the father of, jo of Joseph and these brothers. And Jacob used to send Joseph out, hey, go check on the brothers. Go see what they're doing. And Jacob would go back and report and say, they're doing this and they're doing that. And so the older brothers didn't really care for him. So he was like the, the runt of the family. Joseph was. Well, th the brothers were done. They were done. They concocted this plan. They sold him. And here we have, here we have Joseph sold. Let me share another history with you. So before he sold, he shares his dreams with his brothers and his dad. He shares these details about his dreams and his brothers say, what, you think we're going to bow down to you someday? What? You're crazy. So to add to that, um, that relationship, that conflict that the brothers had with the younger brother. There, were, there was no way that they're going to bow down to the little brother. Amen. So, so Joseph shares his dreams. Now, how many of you guys know that when you have dreams, sometimes it's a little too premature when, we sh premature when we share dreams. And then you have some haters in the house when you share dreams. When you share the visions and purposes that God has for your life and you dare to say, well, God's going to use me in this way. It's okay to, to, to say, God is going to use me this way. Sometimes we need some discernment to say, okay, God, open my mouth at the right time. Keep my mouth shut when it's time, you know. And sometimes those, those things are revealed a little too prematurely. I'm not saying that's an excuse why Joseph was sold. But that's just a little life nugget. Take it to the bank, okay. Find out that sometimes you say things when you shouldn't say things, amen. So, so he's sold. And then on top of that, on top of that, not only is he sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites, then after that, he's sold again. So he's sold again now to this man named Potiphar. Everyone say Potiphar. Potiphar. Okay, so this man, I, I just love how God works. Potiphar was the official of Pharaoh, the king. So he's not just any man in the land. He is a high official to the king in the land, Pharaoh. And so he sold to this other man. And so the Bible says that God, that Potiphar saw God in Joseph. Now there's something about being thrown into a pit, being sold, and all hell breaks loose in your life and God is still evident in your life. Now I should have some people in this house who are deciding to, 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 for God to be evident in their life when you're going through all hell, when your when your husband's acting a fool or your children are acting a fool or you did not get the promotion, there should be a God that is seen and evident on your life. If anything, read the passages and let that encourage you this morning. You need to tell yourself, okay, God, there's been a curveball thrown my way and things have not turned out as I planned, but God is going to be seen on my life. I'm going to choose for. God to be seen in and on my life. So I love that about Potiphar because Potiphar, the word says that he acknowledged, he recognized there's something different about this man. God is in him. He says that God is in him. Now, does that 
take Joseph out of captivity? No, he, has, he was just sold twice. And now he's a slave of this, this mas his master now, Potiphar. So that didn't change his circumstances. Can we say that did not change his circumstances? I know that's a long sentence. I want you to realize that when life happens, your, your relationship in God doesn't have to go in the trash can. That's when you need to put it in full gear. And you need to dart, not even dart. <laughs> the other day someone corrected me. I'm not darting the throne room of God. I'm running to the throne room of God. I'm not just going to barely tap this presence. I'm going to submerge myself in the presence of God when life hits, when all hell breaks loose in my life. And so for Joseph to be evident, for him to, to um, reflect that God was in him, do you not think that he was darting, not darting, he was running to the presence of God? He was in the presence of God. That is what kept him going day by day as a slave. So when, so when, when, we're, when we are in our messes, I love that when we are in our messes, when, when we get sour deals in life, come on somebody, I'm not going to throw any lemons to you. I'm sure Pastor would, but I'm not going to throw you any lemons. When we get sour deals in our lives, when our minds are insane because we don't know what to do, when our children are acting crazy, when my own stupidity gets in the way, when, when my great ability to say the wrong thing at the wrong time, God is willing to be in that place with you. Amen? Only if you're willing to be in God. Amen. But if you're not in God, then you left the cloud, honey, and he ain't with you. So you need to stay in the cloud so you can be blessed when you are in that prison, when you are captive by, by whomever and are a slave to them. So we need to be found in the presence of God. The Bible doesn't say that Joseph was found in the presence of God, but I know that if, if something about my life shines that, is, that demonstrates and reflects the presence of God, it's not because I just picked up the Bible today. No, it's because I have a relationship with him. It's because I am praying. And it's because I am darting the, the throne room of God. And I'm not praising myself. And I'm not saying that with pride. But I have gone through a few things in my life that ha I have had no choice but to bow my knee and say, God, you are author and you are finisher of my faith. I don't know how this is going to work out, but you got it. Amen. God was behind it for Joseph. He is going to be behind it for me. Can I get an amen? So... So we, we need to be found in the presence of God so I can be used. Because we'll read in a few passages in a minute that, that Potiphar recognizes that, that, that God is in him. And I'm going to back that up. Genesis 39, 2 through 5 says, As it turned out, God was with Joseph and things went very well with him. He ended up living in the home of his Egyptian master. His master recognized that God was with him, saw that God was working for good in everything he did. He became very fond of Joseph and made him his personal aid. He put him in charge of all his personal affairs, turning everything over, over to him. From that moment on, God blessed the home of the Egyptian, all because of Joseph. This is the man that's captive. God blessed the master all because of Joseph. The blessing of God spread over everything he owned at home and in the fields. And all Potiphar had to concern himself was eating three meals a day. So God was in Joseph. And God was evident through Joseph. So <clears throat> just as things can't get any worse for Joseph, he gets accused of seducing Potiphar's wife. He gets sold twice, and now he's accused by his master's wife. Because, see, the Bible says that Joseph was a handsome man. He, can I get an amen from all the ladies? Joseph was a handsome man. He was a very handsome man. And the Bible says that Potiphar's wife was infatuated with him. So she liked the help in the house, okay? She was liking the help walking around the house, which was Joseph. And so she tried to seduce him. And so what happens when, when, when this wife tries to seduce him? Does Joseph give in to this? No. Joseph says, I don't think so, Hussey. I don't think so. I have a master who is real willing to cut my head off. Because if you don't know this, back in the day, they cut people's heads off, right? They stoned people to death. Here you go to jail. He, back in the day, you, get, you, you would get your head decapitated or you get stoned. That's just the way it was. Okay, so he knew. He knew the, his master. So what happened was he threw him in jail now. So now he, he's turned some sour lemons into some very sour lemonade. Not because he chose to, but he finds himself, his life unraveling, spiraling downward. He's like going further and further into the, the dungeon of sour lemonade. 
So he ends up in this, in this jail, and now he comes in contact with two jailers. And what is it the thing that, that, that really the, the, the brothers despise? Not the most, but one of the things they despised back in the day when, when he was with his family. He shared his dreams. Remember he shared his dreams? And the brothers couldn't stand him. They envied him. Well, in this jailhouse, Joseph is still operating with his gifting. Now, many of us in this place today, we throw in the towel. And we say, God's not going to use me. I messed up. Can I just tell you that if you are repentant and you turn from your wicked ways and you turn your heart, you prostrate before the Lord and you make things right before him, you may have some consequences. But if you make it right, God will use you. I don't care what anyone has to say about your past, what you did last week, what you did last year. God is willing to use you. Amen. So in your mess, God can turn your mess around and bless you. And not only bless you, but he will use you. Amen. So he's in this jailhouse and he starts to interpret dreams of these jailmates. So he's trading his his goulash. That's what jailmates do. I think they have, they, they have goulash and, and they get money. Okay, maybe I'm not talking to the right crowd. Okay, so anyways, um, he's trading his, if, if you do this for me, I'll tell you the interpretation of that dream. He's sharing his, the interpretation of the dreams that the jailers are having. Well, later he gets out. No, he's still in jail. One day, King Pharaoh, King Pharaoh is struggling. This is not Potiphar. This is a king, the king of Egypt. King Pharaoh is struggling with some dreams that, that dreams that he's having, and he cannot interpret the dreams. And he seeks out the magicians to interpret his dreams, and the magicians cannot interpret the, the dreams. And then this jailer, who you, this person who used to be in jail with this Hebrew boy named Joseph said, oh, I know who can interpret your dreams. He goes, there's this little Hebrew boy named Joseph. He's not a Hebrew, little Hebrew boy anymore, but they, 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 they mark him that he's a Hebrew boy. And Pharaoh's like, well, bring him to me. And Joseph interprets the dreams. And Joseph is caught in the courts of the king. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when life has gone sour in my life, I see God's provision in it too. We have seen God's provision in the midst of all hell and chaos. And, in, and he, here's the thing. We have a choice to look for that. Or we have a choice not to look for that. I choose to find God's provision in my chaos. I choose to find hope in my chaos. I choose to believe the word of the Lord. I don't care what my circumstances look like. I choose to believe the word of the Lord in my circumstances. So he interprets his dreams. He's used in mighty ways. He's still a slave. He still can't forget the past. He was sold by his, by his brothers, left to die, then sold again. That doesn't, that doesn't make you forget everything that happened in the past. But it makes you appreciate how God is using Joseph, even in this place. Joseph interprets the dreams for Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh is in awe about how this man can interpret the dreams and so let's see. Let's go to the book of Genesis. 41, 33 through 44. And it says, so Pharaoh, so Pharaoh needs to look for a wise and experienced man and put him in charge. Okay, so I got to back up a little bit because I can't let you forget. I can't let you not know this. So the dreams that he interpreted were uh, uh, a future occurrence that was going to happen. And there was going to be a famine in the land. you got to read all those details. They're so good. You have to read them. There's going to be a famine in the land. And Pharaoh, I am preparing you for this famine. You need to get your ducks in order. You need to start growing some grain and collecting all your supplies because there's going to be some famine in the land. That is what Joseph interprets. And so now Pharaoh has this wealth of information that he has to do something with. And now he needs to prepare his land for this famine that's coming. So we know that that information came through Joseph. That information came through Joseph. So let's go back to the passage. And now he needs to find somebody who's going to help him through this famine. Back to verse 33. 
So Pharaoh needs to look for a wise and experienced man and put him in charge of the country. Then Pharaoh needs to appoint managers, managers throughout the country of Egypt to organize it during the years of plenty. Their job will be to collect all the food produced in the good years ahead and stockpile the grain under Pharaoh's authority, storing it in the towns for food. This grain will be held back to be used later during the seven years of famine that are coming on Egypt. This way, the country won't be devastated by famine. This seemed like a good idea to Pharaoh and his officials. Then Pharaoh said to his officials, isn't this the man we need? Referring to Joseph. Are we going to find anyone else who has God's spirit in him like this? His own enemy identifies that God's spirit is in him. I'm here to encourage you today that if you don't dart the presence of God in your mess, the spirit of God will not rest. So I need you to dart the presence of God, be in his presence. When you get the bad report, when you get a, a call in the midnight hour, because God was still resting on Joseph's life. He had come all this far. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, you're the man for us. God has given you the inside story. No one is as qualified as you in, in experience and wisdom. From now on, you're in charge of my affairs. All my people will report to you. Only as king will I be over you. Now, I don't know if you caught that. He gave him full authority over his kingdom. Do you get that? Over his entire, he gave him the keys. Here, do as you will. Everyone has to run through you, has to funnel every decision through you. Let's not forget that he's a slave to the kingdom first. Okay, now he's given the king, the keys to the kingdom. Can I get an amen? God will give you the keys to a brand new house. I don't care if you foreclosed two years ago. I don't care if you short sailed. I don't care if your car was repossessed two years ago. He will bless you with a brand new spanking new car. If that is God's will for your life and you're seeking God and you're pursuing him, he will bless you in your mess. Amen. And sometimes those messes come because we've made poor choices, right? And thank God for the grace of God. Amen. We have the grace that, that, that his grace abounds. So he's given the keys. And ultimately, this slave is put in charge of this kingdom. And I think it's powerful because his own captor sees God in him. His own captor can deliver him. Can I get an amen? The Bible, everybody was on my message this morning. Pastor Tito was on my message this morning. How he'll prepare a table before your very enemies. He will. He will. And then, and then the worship team was all over my message. Like, draw me a little closer. And, and that he's sweet. It is your choice to walk to the kitchen and make some lemonade. Amen. Joseph could have gone back and said, I'm not going to be captive by these people. I'm going back to my father. I'm going to let him know who sold me to these people. No, but he stayed, endured, was in the presence of God. And the Bible says that God was with him even when he was given the keys to the kingdom. I just love that. I love that. If anything can give you hope, this story should give you hope. This story should give you hope that he can turn something around for your good. Amen. He can turn something around for your good. So he's given the keys to this kingdom. You know, we have a famine in the land. And remember who the boss is. Who's the boss? Joseph. Joseph is the boss in this land. Not Pharaoh. He has um, authorize this man to be the boss during this famine. And, and there, there's much time that's going by. You know, we have seven years of preparation, seven years of famine. So time is ticking. Many of us give up first time we pray. We don't hear, we don't see an answered prayer by next week, we give up. We throw in the towel. The deal goes bad. The deal goes sour and we throw in the towel. This man has endured. We can already count it was 17 when he was sold. We can already count already a decade that has passed. So I'm here to encourage you today that, that I don't care how sour life can be or how, how curveball that, that, that ball comes your way or how shocked and your jaw drops as to when you hear the news. God is faithful. He's faithful. I'm not faithful, but he's faithful. I'm just doing my part. I'm going to pursue him with everything inside of me. My heart is going to be positioned towards him. So we have this famine in the land. And so I want to give you a picture of this that, that's, in, that's more relatable. Think about catastrophic events. Think about tsunamis. Think about um, class four, class five hurricanes. Who shows up on the scene? FEMA. Everybody say FEMA. FEMA. 
You hear through the grapevine, oh, FEMA's stationed over there and they've made camp. They're giving toiletries. They're giving food. They're giving fresh water because everything is tainted. You're, you can't run water through the, through the piping because the water's tainted. Everything's mixed. There's, you, your refrigeration has gone kaput. Everything, everything's gone. And FEMA shows up on the scene during a catastrophic event. There's a famine. Listen, there's nothing like going to FEMA when you have no electricity, you don't have a generator, and there's no air conditioning in your house. Okay, we live in Florida, and it's hot here. Okay, so you need some air conditioning. So you're going to go find some help because you need some provision, amen? You need some provision during a catastrophic event. So I want you to picture Joseph is during this. Joseph is the, the boss during this famine. And this, this is going to take me back to the original passage that we read. We come onto a scene that is powerful to me. This is Genesis 45, 4. This is Joseph talking. And Joseph says, come closer to me, Joseph said to his brothers. This is not just a day's time. This is years of stirring up thinking, when I see them, I'm going to tell them this and this and that. When I see, I hope that they, you know, wishing the best. Not really wishing the best, but really like praying brimstone down on them. But he's on the scene. And he says, come closer to me, Joseph said to his brothers. And they came closer. So they come like a dog with a tail between his legs, with their, with their legs. And he says... I am Joseph, your brother, whom you, whom you sold into Egypt. But don't feel badly. Don't blame yourselves for selling me. God was behind it. Now, that is forgiveness. That is a lot of years of God working with my heart. That is a lot of years of me saying, God, I surrender. I have been, I have been done wrong. These people have spoken ill about me. They have slapped me. They have betrayed me. They have spoken behind my back that aren't. The things that they're saying are not true. But he says, don't blame yourselves for selling me. God was behind it. God was behind it the entire time. Okay, so I'm going to deviate a little bit just to give you some, some um, information so you can, so this can ponder a little further in your, in your mind. So we're going to go to the, the third book of John, chapter 1, 2 through 4. And you have John writing to a friend. And he says, and we've heard this passage many times, um, how truly I love you. We're the best of friends, and I pray for good fortune in everything you do and for good health, that your everyday affairs prosper as well as your soul. I was most happy when some friends arrived and brought the news that you persist in following the way of truth. Nothing could make me happier than getting reports that my children continue diligently. See, I don't know if you know what persistence means. Persistence is continuing firmly or obstinately in a, in a course of action in spite of difficulty. In spite of difficulty or continuing to exist or endure over a pro, prolonged period of time. See, it's not God's will for your soul to deteriorate. And go to hell in a handbasket when life happens. It is not his will for your life. Do I want to do that? Yes. Do I feel like doing it? Yes. Does my soul, my mind, will, and emotion want to do that? Yes. I can do that for 24 hours. But I better get back up again. And I may, I may have to say, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I may have to say that in faith because I may not see how God's going to get me out of this. But we have to know that we have to be persistent and diligent in this thing called the race of faith. Amen. This thing called life. When lemons come our way, we need to know, okay, God, I am in this for the long haul. I'm not just in this for a year or two. I am in this for the long haul. So I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to be in your presence no matter what. Throw me in prison. Throw me in jail. Sell me. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to be in your presence in Jesus' name. See, I love what David says. David says, there are mercies new every single morning. So tomorrow is a new day. Expect his mercies tomorrow morning. Say, God, thank you. It's a new day. Yesterday is gone. Today is a new day. Bless me today. Bless me in the field. Bless me in the city. Bless the fruit of my hands. Start making declarations over yourself. Do you not think that Joseph was in that position, in that state of mind? How else do you endure being sold, becoming a slave, then accused if he's not in the presence of God? 
His mercies are new every morning. My life is founded on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Amen. That rock that we stand on is Jesus Christ. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. Try it. I bank on it. He will show up if you just dart his strong room. He will show up and he will, he will bottle every single tear in your life. He did it for Joseph and he's going to do it for us. He's going to do it for us. So I want, I want to encourage you today that you're not alone, you're not abandoned, you're not on this good old earth by yourself in this big universe. He is the author of the universe. He is the maker of every sea, every tree, every star, every fish, every rock, every piece of grass, every weed. He knows what you need. And can I tell you that God is behind it. God is behind it. If you are in a situation where life has dealt you a sour deal in life, can I remind you today that God is behind it. He may have not caused it, but he is permitting it. Amen. He is permitting it. So you know what? You, you are called to endure. You are, you are called to, to be persistent and, 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 and walk out this, this thing called life. Amen. Walk out this race of faith in Jesus mighty name. So I want you to remember Joseph and I want you to remember this passage because he tells his brothers, God was behind it. God was behind it the entire time. God was behind it. I'm going to leave you with two passages. Psalms 119, 9 through 11 says, But you, Israel, put your trust in God. But you, O Israel, put your trust in God. So in, in, my, in my verse, there are exclamation points at the very end of every line that I'm going to read. And I was taught in grammar school that exclamation points are emotion. Great emotion. I am excited. It's not God I put my trust in you. No, it is I put my trust in you. It is I put my trust in you. So let me read. But you, Israel, put your trust in God. Trust your helper. Trust your ruler. Clan of Aaron, trust in God. And you may be sitting here today. I'm not of Israel. I'm not of Aaron. But let me tell you who you are. You who fear God, trust in God. You, who's the you? You, you who fear God, trust in God. Trust your helper, trust your ruler. Who is your helper? God Almighty. Who is your ruler? God Almighty. Trust Him, trust Him. And lastly, Psalms 119. This is to encourage you to stay the course. Stay the course. You're blessed when you stay on course, walking steadily on the road, the road revealed by God. You're blessed when you follow his directions. Sometimes we miss the mark, but God is, God is graceful. You're blessed when you follow his directions, doing your best to find him, doing your best to pursue him, being in that prayer closet, darting, running to the presence of God, going to the throne room of God that's full of grace and mercy and truth for you. That's right. You don't go off on your own. Sometimes we go off on our own. Thank God for His grace. You walk straight along the road, He said. You, God, prescribe the right way to live. Now you expect us to live it. God is just like a daddy. He lays out some instructions. The Bible says, choose you this day who you will serve. Blessing or cursing. Oh, that my steps might be steady. That is my prayer when I get some sour lemons. That is my prayer when life gets messy and we get dirty. That is my prayer when my jeans end up ripped because I'm darting the presence of God, because I am seeking His face. Because in the midst of every situation represented today, God is behind it. I want, I want you to believe that today. God is behind it. He may not cause it, but He, he may have permitted and our only choice and our only thing to do is to be found in his presence, is to be found in him because God is behind it. If God was seen in Joseph, God can be seen in you. Amen. But it is a choice this morning. It is a choice to make lemonade. It is a choice to walk into the kitchen and cut up some lemons and make lemonade. Either you can sit there with a basket full of lemons and say, woe is me. And tomorrow will come and it'll be woe is me again. Or you can sit there today with your back, basket full of lemons and, and choose to go to the kitchen and make some lemonade because God will sweeten it. He will sweeten your life. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that he is good. 
Hey everyone, hey Pastor Daniel, I hope that you enjoyed the message today. Powerful word, powerful word from God. And we want you to get connected with us. We want to hear from you. If you gave your heart to the Lord today from the message, we want to hear from you. Email us at admin at peakworship.com and give us the good news so we could celebrate with you. And we want you to check out the website, peakworship.com. And we want you to like us on Facebook and Instagram. You can like me on um, Facebook and Instagram personally. We want to get connected with you. We want to share our hearts with you and we want to hear more about what's going on in your life. So make sure that you get plugged in and get connected.